Welcome, everyone. We'll wait just a minute or so to allow everyone to enter the room. It always takes a few minutes. Welcome to History Behind the Headlines, Approaches to Teaching Israel-Palestine. My name is Jim Grossman. I'm the Executive Director of the American Historical Association, the largest professional organization in the world, serving historians in all fields and in all sorts of workplaces and professions. The AHA promotes history education, the professional work of historians, and the essential role of historical thinking in public life. Today's event is part of the AHA's History Behind the Headlines series, which features historians providing historical context for current events, suggesting how historical thinking can provide different angles on the world around us. The History Behind the Headlines series is generously sponsored by AHA member Jared Brubaker. Today's discussion, which will run until 4 p.m. Eastern Time, brings together four leading scholars to discuss teaching the conflict in Israel-Palestine. Our discussion will be moderated by James Ryan, who is the Director of Research and the Middle East Program at the Foreign Policy Institute. He is trained as a historian and an expert on Turkish and Middle Eastern affairs. He received his PhD in history from the University of Pennsylvania and has previously served as the Associate Director of the Habba Kovarkian Center for Near Eastern Studies at New York University. Dr. Ryan has also taught classes at the University of Pennsylvania and New York University and regularly speaks with K through 12 and community audiences about historical and contemporary topics related to the Middle East. Jim Ryan is also a member of the program committee for the 2024 American Historical Association annual conference in San Francisco in January. Our goal for this conversation is to generate light, not heat. We are here to help teachers meet challenges that Katarina Matro, Matro will articulate in opening the discussion. This program is not a debate. It is not a venue for advocacy of one position or another. We'll be, we will be addressing the challenges that history teachers have communicated to us. This is consistent with the two things that people hear most from the American Historical Association. Everything has a history and how can we help? I will now turn the event over to Jim Ryan. Jim, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, and I, I really wanna uh, say upfront how much I appreciate uh, all of the work that's been put into hosting this webinar uh, on the behalf of Jim and all of the staff at the AHA. Uh, and, and also for the, the attention, you know, special attention paid by the AHA to uh, addressing this issue uh, at this particular time. Um, I, as Jim said, I'm going to be moderating uh, this event. I am going to briefly introduce uh, all of our speakers. And uh, then you know we have a, a set of questions we've all been kicking around for the last uh, day or so that we're going to get into and try and open up a discussion about how uh, you know, teachers at the high school and early college level uh, can address the, this conflict in uh, you know a moment such as the one that we're dealing with, where tensions are, are you know particularly high, um, it's a it's a problem that I think everyone on this panel has faced before, is facing now in some uh, form or fashion, and you know I just want to you know emphasize like this is this is something for those of us who deal with the Middle East, we're we're actually quite familiar with and, and deal with it at at many points uh, across our careers. So in order to get started, I want to uh, introduce our panelists. Um, with us today is Omer Bartov. I'm going to go in alphabetical order. Uh, Omer Bartov is the Samuel Pisar Professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Brown University. He was born in Israel and educated at Tel Aviv University and St. Anthony's College, Oxford. 
Uh, Bartok's early research concerned the Nazi indoctrination of the Wehrmacht and crimes it committed in World War II. And his most recent book is Genocide, the Holocaust, and Israel-Palestine, a first-person history in times of crisis. Uh, next, we have Michelle Campos, who is Associate Professor of Jewish Studies and History at Penn State University. Her work contributes to the history of Palestine and Israel, the history of late Ottom the late Ottoman Empire, and the making of the modern Middle East, and Sephardic Jewish studies. She's the author of Ottoman Brothers, Muslims, Christians, and Jews in Early 20th Century Palestine, and is currently completing a book on neighborhood life and intercommunal relations in 19th and early 20th century Jerusalem. Next, we have Usama Makdisi, who is Professor of History and Chancellor's Chair at the University of California, Berkeley, who is previously Professor of History and the first holder of the Arab American Educational Foundation Chair of Arab Studies at Rice University in Houston. Uh, Dr. Makdisi is the author of four books on Ottoman and Arab history and the history of Arab-U.S. relations, most recently, The Age of Coexistence, The Ecumenical Frame, and The Making of the Modern Arab World. And uh, lastly, but certainly not leastly, least, and the person to whom I'm actually going to hand over the mic first uh, is Katerina Metro. Uh, she teaches courses in sociology, U.S. history, world history, and Middle Eastern history at Walter Johnson High School in Bethesda, Maryland. And she is also a member of the AHA's Governing Council. She holds an MA from Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and a PhD in Central European History from Stanford University. Uh, so I'm really, really glad to be kicking this off. Uh, and I'm going to hand things over to Katerina, who's going to pose a couple, our first couple of questions from the perspective of the high school classroom. Katerina. Thank you. And, and thank you for inviting me to be on this panel. I'm one of those teachers who has been reaching out to the AHA, telling them, help me. So I'm glad that we're actually doing this. So I want to, I want to throw out two questions that are both rooted in, I think, the unique context in which uh, high schools operate in our communities and, and sort of the unique um, expectations that high school teachers face and unique constraints that are maybe a little bit different from, from um, the context that scholars face who are teaching at the university level. So the, the first context which uh, teachers have become very familiar over the course of the last few years is that communities, local communities, feel like they have a huge stake in what happens in the social studies classroom. Um, we've seen that with the U.S. history curriculum and with school boards and communities trying to prescribe or censor what is going on um, in the history classroom and what history teachers can and cannot teach. Um, and this is certainly true for the current conflict um, in the Middle East as well. Parents and community members close to either side of the conflict are complaining to school administrations, are complaining to school boards about teachers getting the story all wrong. And the result has been that teachers are just not going to teach uh, this conflict at all or don't really feel comfortable teaching it. It feels safer to just not talk about it. So we find ourselves in this circumstance in which students are actually genuinely interested in figuring out what is going on. And they're turning to their history teachers and asking questions. They wanted to be able to discuss this conflict knowledgeably uh, with sensitivity. They are actually interested in having um, civil discussions around this issue um, I'm thinking for the first time they want to be in my classroom, but teachers are shying away for, from the topic and are, are understandably uncertain about how to approach um, the topic because in the back of their minds, they fear uh, getting it wrong and then being reprimanded for it. So my, my first question, given this context, is how can we help teachers help students learn how we got here that idea of everything has a history in a way that maybe incorporates many different angles of vision but without having to worry or fear about maybe inadvertently favoring one narrative or favoring the wrong narrative or favoring just one side that's the first question the second high school context is more practical, but also 
very real for teachers. And that's the time constraint. And, and the content demands that teachers face. So in the two classic history classes that students will encounter in high school, US history and world history, at most, the, con the narrative of the conflict will get 45 minutes at most. And in a world history class, they might uh, talk about the aftermaths of World War I and World War II. US history teachers might briefly talk about the Yom Kippur War and why oil was expensive in the US as a result. And that's it. But the problem is it, with a conflict this long and a conflict that features such fiercely competing narratives, how can a teacher teach this conflict with sufficient nuance in a short amount of time, right? Um, to students who probably don't even know how to place Egypt or Israel on a map. So that's that's an additional constraint. How do we how do we do all of that when they come in with nothing in a short amount of time? My colleagues who I've talked to, they don't even know where to begin. Um, how do we answer such basic questions as why is the Gaza Strip where it is? What is Hamas? Why is Hamas in charge of the Gaza Strip? So how do we go about teaching this conflict in 45 minutes, essentially? Or in other words, how do, teach, how do we teach something that's very complicated in a way that's not too complicated to understand at a basic level? And again, how do we teach it in a way uh, that is not two sides, a story about two sides, but a nuanced history that can be looked at from many different angles of vision. So those are two, my two questions. This community supervision of teachers and the short amount of time for a very complicated subject. Uh, thank you for that, Katharina. I want to give uh, everyone a chance to to respond to that. Um, you know, I, I think that the sort of cycle we talked about before the uh, program started was was to start with Michelle. If, if you feel like you're ready to respond for that, do you want to go ahead? Sure, thank you. Um, thank you, Jim, for inviting me. Thanks to the AHA for organizing this. Thank you to my fellow distinguished um, historian panelists. And uh, I just want to preface this by saying that I'm really excited that the AHA is bringing together high school teachers with university professors, because I have to say that um, it's, I have now taught at three, in three different states, three different institutions, two of which were state institutions. And in none of those positions have I ever come in with a sense of what the high school students of that state actually learn, what preparation they have before they arrive in our classroom. Uh, and it's only now that my oldest uh, child is himself a high schooler that I've seen what they're doing in the AP world and APUSH, uh, AP US history. So I think that we need a lot more of these kinds of dialogues. I know the AHA does that. So I want to respond to Katarina's questions. Um, one of the questions that was posed to us um, that you didn't get to today, but I think is a really important subsidiary is you asked if there was a right way to teach this history. And I'll preface this by saying that um, I think there's a wrong way to teach this history. And the wrong way is similar to the wrong way to teach any kind of history, which is a historically with kind of monocausal explanations, uh, privileging one narrative or one voice or one perspective, uh, ideologically driven um, or in other words, I think the wrong way to teach this is to exceptionalize it. And unfortunately, I think that this conflict is presented as exceptional outside of history um, in many ways in the U.S. media and U.S. popular culture, uh, and even in some of the textbooks uh, or histories that are available to us. So I would say that first, um, it would be uh, important for high school history teachers to deal with this the way that they deal with other historical phenomenon or periods or questions or conflicts in the classroom. Um, and to this, I really am drawing on the AHA's tuning project, which I think is a fabulous resource. Uh, and it's something that I have incorporated now into my own class syllabi, the, their emphasis on these five C's of historical thinking, right? So context, change over time, causality, complexity, contingency. And I brought that into my class syllabi because I realized that perhaps 
you know, I was incorrect in assuming that all students were exposed to these. I sort of assumed that um, th this was kind of the underpinnings of historical inquiry, but really drawing it into the syllabi and drawing it into our classes uh, day after day, week after week, and returning to that is a way, I think, of normalizing this history, that we analyze it as we analyze other histories, is a way of calling uh, attention to uh, the kinds of choices that we make, the multiplicity of perspectives that we incorporate, the complexity of this debate, that it's not you know just two sides, that there are multiple narratives uh, to bring into it. So I think that focusing on those historical skills and tools, like I'm sure you're all doing um, in other you know, historical periods or historical contexts like that and bringing it into this conflict, which is so often depicted as being exceptional, one of a kind, et cetera, would be a really important thing to do. Um, I also think it's really important to, again, draw attention to the fact of what is history, right? These are not just um, current events are not just, you know, facts that can be debated because of people's, you know, predisposed ideological positions, but that we talk about historical evidence, the kinds of historical sources uh, that are available to us, uh, the kinds of interpretations and arguments that historians make, again, as a way of um, de-exceptionalizing this conflict and uh, really connecting it to the skills that students are being exposed to. And in terms of your second question about the time, um, what can you do in limited amounts of time? I think, again, connecting it to whatever content or analytical or theoretical framing students have been exposed to in the class for other moments, for other places would be really important. So to build on what they know, whether that is about how nationalist movements emerge, how they're mobilized, how they're contested, how they're, you know, debated, those kinds of things would be really important, or whether it be about, you know, migration patterns or colonialism, but really, I mean, you would only know, each individual teacher would know in their classroom what students have been exposed to, and really draw that into this discussion and to see how we can then look at this conflict uh, by building on what they know. Um, I think the last thing I'll say before I turn it over to my fellow panelists is that it's okay to acknowledge, I think, it's okay to acknowledge a lack of expertise or a lack of knowledge uh, and to share that with students and to share that as a way of talking about how do we learn about things in the world that are not in our bailiwick, um, how do we analyze sources for their reliability, uh, for their underpinning biases. Um, so I think in terms of thinking about what would be really useful for the students coming into my classroom at Penn State is to have a really good sense uh, that they know how to read things critically. They know how to read the internet critically. They know how to, they understand what Wikipedia is and what Wikipedia isn't, for example. Um, they understand what uh, expertise is and how scholars, uh, you know, earn that expertise and uh, what that means in terms of the kinds of debates and discussions that historians have between them. Um, and along those lines, I would also say that I think we all face these time constraints in the classroom, whether it's, you know, because we are teaching a modern Middle East survey where we might have only one or two class sessions for this particular conflict because we're covering 250 years in a giant region. Um, or even if it's a semester long course on the conflict, there's always going to be something that we leave out. And so, you know, what I like to do is to really um, highlight those choices to the students uh, in the syllabus. We talk about it at the beginning, we revisit it several times. What are we not looking at by framing it in the particular way that we're framing it? What kinds of voices are not available, either because they're not translated uh, or because we don't have access to them? We, we talk about power in the archives and who has uh, the power to uh, narrate history, but also who is leaving those, uh, who has the power to erase history. So these are all the kinds of things um, that I think I'm, you know, very, deliberate in sharing with the students about how there's never going to be um, a 45 session, 45 minute or even 15 week answer to one thing, uh, but it's really giving them those base tools for thinking historically, for analyzing sources, for even evaluating the media critically and uh, thinking about what are, what are the messages they're receiving about this conflict and how can we think about them historically. So those are my first, first thoughts and I look forward to hearing from others. Uh, that's wonderful, Michelle. Great way to, to kick us off and some important questions. Uh, Omer, I want to turn to you next. Uh, you know, your response to Katerina, and if you want to build on anything Michelle had to say. Sure, thank you, and thank you for having me here. Uh, I agree that it's an important conversation. Um, I mean, the problem you pose to us is basically 
impossible to resolve. Uh, 45 minutes um, is, um, let's face it, uh, is very little. Um, so what does one do? Um, and I should say that uh, often in college <clears throat> or university, uh, I think that this period is not taught well either. Um, and I would say that there, there are many problems why, but one of them is that uh, people actually do tend to take sides and students are very well aware of it. And so what often happens, and this may happen less in high school, um, is that because uh, professors take sides, students take sides, and so they divide uh, according to where the professors are, uh, which professor they want to study with. And so um, the period itself is taught in a way that reflects some of what is going on uh, in, in the place itself. So that's something I think that is important to try to avoid, not uh, necessarily just to seem totally objective, but to be able to present uh, the events in a manner that appears and that one is trying to present in the most balanced way. And that's a challenge. That's hard. For that reason, I actually would not call it teaching the conflict, because once you start saying, I'm teaching the conflict, you're already in a conflictual situation. You're already, you are taking sides. And much of the history uh, is not a history of conflict. There is conflict there, but uh, people live uh, daily lives. People have cultures, have memories, have histories, and not all of them are part of the conflict, um, or they can resonate with the conflict. They can have a relationship with the conflict, but they also exist outside of it. And there may be many other conflicts, uh, and not only that conflict. Um, there's conflicts between generations, there's conflicts between regions, there's all kinds of other things going on. And if you focus just on the conflict, you've already, in a sense, predetermined what you're going to teach. So I, I would sort of try to, uh, not to avoid it, but to put it in a larger context. Um, so that's... Um, to me, it's important. Now, um, I think that often because people come with uh, certain predetermined opinions, it's very important to uh, provide some kind of historical framework, um, both in terms of facts, in terms of geographies, in terms of chronologies. Um, when you study history, that's the first thing that you're told. History is, first of all, geography and chronology. Um, and often people come to that region uh, lacking the chronology and the geography, but they may have very strong opinions. And if they knew a little bit about the chronology and the geography, um, which are never entirely objective, but are at least more so than opinions um, that might temper the uh, predilection to immediately jump to sides and to have opinions. Um, and, and, and as we know, certainly if you're teaching this region at the moment, uh, people have very strong opinions and often very little knowledge. And so you want to try and balance that a little bit in, in any classroom, I think. Uh, another way that I think is very important, and that's, uh, uh, Jim was sort of citing the, the, the subtitle of the book that I was, uh, that I published just now, uh, is uh, personal histories. Because much of what we, we think we know, uh, and, the reason we sort of have opinions about things uh, is that we are um, being given a history that is often told from a distance, that is told from the top, that creates already a historical pattern that we then can take sides on. But if you uh, try to understand that history through personal experiences of people who lived through it at a particular time, 
and they tell you about themselves, then you start thinking about it in a more empathetic mode. And then whatever opinions you might have when you're hearing the story of someone, if you may be reading a diary, you may be reading parts of a memoir, you may be reading a work of fiction, um, you begin to empathize with that particular individual and you are getting what used to be called a kind of history from below and a history from within. And so you understand that the history that is happening there is ultimately the same history that you are experiencing yourself. It's something that is experienced by people, not just by opinions and ideologies and interpretations. It's also just the individuals who are there. And I think for young people, but I must say not only for young people, uh, that experience of getting to know someone, a real person or, or, or a fictional person, also remains with you. It's something that you will take with you, that whenever you hear somebody, you know, opining about uh, that region or the conflict, uh, this person will come to mind. And I think that that, that can, <clears throat> can help. Uh, and you write about this thing, um, that there's a tendency to think about that region, as Samantha Power said about Southeastern Europe uh, in her book, A Problem from Hell. So that's a place that's prone to always uh, be radically different and usually violent with all kind of very passionate people um, uh, being at each other's throats. Uh, and and so again, if if you look at it through humanizing stories, you may have develop a slightly different view of it. And and the last thing I'll say for now is that I think that uh, using some documents really helps. And um, at least from my memories from high school, uh, which are a little faint by now, um, um, I, I recall some documents that we read uh, because it brings you very close to the event itself. If you read something, um, I don't know what it might be. You read a text from the, the 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 UN partition resolution, or you read uh, the Balfour Declaration. Um, you suddenly have a sort of e immediacy of the moment at which something was written. Somebody had written something that then echoed through decades. Um, and I think for students to to have that sense of um, they're not touching the original document, but they're re reading it uh, often in the original language. In this case, uh, these would have been in English, uh, brings them closer in another way because they can see the difference between the interpretation that the teacher gives them or the history book tells them and the document itself, and they can actually participate then in interpreting. They can say, well, I read this differently from this historian. So it gives them a sense of agency that I think is important, especially, I think, especially in high school, but very much also, of course, with college students. So I'll stop here for now. Thank you, Omer. And I know, uh, you know all of us who have taught like introductory Middle East courses would just love it if our students came to us with better senses of the geography and the chronology, we could do so much more in the classroom if students had just that, let alone having read something like the Balfour Declaration, which again, it, this, this stuff is becoming so much more accessible and I hope we can have more conversation about how accessible this history actually is at the moment. Um, Osama, I wanna turn to you uh, to, to build on that and, and answer Katarina's questions. Okay, um, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you um, to, to my colleagues and uh, Michelle and Omar and of course to Katrina as well for posing the questions and Jim to you and to the AHA for, for hosting this session. I mean, obviously it's, it's, uh, I agree with Omar and with Michelle. It's at one level, it's impossible to, to, to teach, um, the history of, of this region in 45 minutes and, and to do it, you know, and to do justice to this history. But so, but I think the more important thing to stress is that we're living, of course, you know, we're historians, we contextualize. That is what we do, for, you know, in all our work. That is what every single one of us, whether it's at the high school level or at a university level does, is contextualize. And I think it would be remiss of us in this moment if we're not sort of acknowledging 
what is apparently ob- what is obvious to me and to to I think many people around the world, um, what is happening in Gaza, the 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 profound sort of horrors of what's going on in Gaza, uh, and and more to the point, the fact of the matter is that we're in a situation where so much of what happens now is premised on decontextualization and dehistorization. And so the question you're asking, Katrina, is is a is it a very important one, which is to say, how do we contextualize? How do we how are we able to learn? How are we able to teach um, in the context of a country that, of course, is not neutral in this so-called conflict? Um, is very much um I, I would say, of course, against the Palestinians and for the Israelis or for the Israeli state and against the Palestinians. I think it's important for us to be able to say things clearly without fear of of recrimination or retribution or retaliation. And that raises the question that that you that you're grappling with, understandably. You mentioned that there's huge pressure, there's a huge amount of censorship. Um, and again, of course, the censorship is coming almost all from one direction and not from the other. I mean, again, to be clear on, on what's going on in this country. Uh, having said that, I would agree that um, the, the first thing I would do, uh, in the way I approach this, is not to teach it as, uh, in fact, I don't teach it as a conflict. That may not help you, Katerina, if you're teaching it as a conflict, because it's, um, I teach it as a history of Palestine. I'm sure others will teach it as a history of Israel or the history of, as, as Michelle does, I'm sure the history of, of uh, X community or Y community. There are many different ways of approaching it at the university level. At a high school level, I think, how does one teach, for example, apartheid South Africa? The history of apartheid, there is a conflict there, but we don't call it a conflict. How do we teach the history of Jim Crow segregation or the history of racism in the United States? We don't call it necessarily a conflict, but again, there are all sorts of issues in history that are profoundly um, um, uh, profound that were profoundly divisive at a particular moment. So, how do we? I mean, so I would just look at how we teach apartheid South Africa and model that, and see how we teach. That's that's the way I would I would suggest doing it uh, with with the understanding, agreeing completely with Omer that documents um, that documentation that um, personal narratives are extraordinarily powerful uh, because they engage students um, as opposed to abstractions and talking about history as facts and dates, but really bringing it to a personal level uh, and humanizing all sides uh, because it's not just two sides in this so-called conflict. There's, there's, I mean, there are Palestinians, there are Israelis, there are, there are many other peoples besides humanizing as much as possible providing students with documents, I think primary documents more than anything else, because there is no other, um, uh, there is no other sort of ongoing uh, catastrophe that is as well documented, as far as I can tell, as this one. And the documents are, as Jim was saying, widely and abundantly available to, to historians. So I would start with a primary document, the Balfour Declaration, for example. And from that, just analyze that. And you could spend 45 minutes just analyzing the Balfour Declaration um, or, or you know, bringing in personal memoirs and so on and so forth. So that that's that's the way I would approach it. But again, ask yourself, how do you or how does one teach, for example, apartheid South Africa? Do you teach it as a question of two sides, or do you teach them that there is a problem or there is a, a an issue, and we need to understand why people took the positions they did on whatever side it is? How is it that they justified the positions they took? And and then let the students debate and discuss, you know, what they think and their con- based on the readings they have and then the documents they have. In other words, always bring it back to the documents and to the history, assuming, of course, that we're allowed to teach this and that you're allowed to teach this. Um, because again, we're in a context, and I think it would be remiss of us not to to pretend that we're not in a context of extreme pressure that's being put on on educators throughout this country to be able to teach the history of Palestine or the history of Palestinians without censorship and without being, um, um, you know, criticized. So, um, but again, conflict, I would say, teach it as a history of people, a history of human beings, a history with costs, a history that, and, and, and in other words, humanize and historicize, always humanize and historicize, or historicize to humanize. That's what I would say. That would be my answer. In 45 minutes, it's it's virtually impossible to do that. Um, but of course, what you're doing is you're setting a model for your students by historicizing and humanizing everyone in this in this in this uh, situation, irrespective of the side they're on. 
Thank you, Osama. And I, I, I really appreciate you, you know, putting your finger on um, you know, the issue of pressure, the issue uh, you know, that Katrina raised of um, you know, concern and, and the, or the fear of, of threat of censorship, which, which can come in so many different ways and from so many different directions. You know, it, it, in, you know this is a diverse country. Uh, and I think high school, or high school teachers feel this in, in ways that you know, I think a lot of uh, university teachers uh, you know, might not because local context shift and change. Uh, so drastically and so quickly in this country, I, I should say. Um, but it, it's such an important point. And I, I want to, you know, make sure that we're all, you know, we all have that empathetic dial turned up uh, to 11, uh, you know, with, with, with when we, you know, are engaging teachers and engaging students and engaging communities on this issue. Um, so I, I, I have a series of questions of my own. Uh, and, and, you know, the first, and, and this, you know, at this point, we might think about both, you know, the high school and the the you know introductory college level here um, because I, I know there's many many teachers in the audience who you know may find themselves teaching aspects of this uh, and having to deal with other aspects of it that they're maybe not used to teaching or facing uh, you know questions uh, in classroom conversations that they maybe haven't broached before or or are looking for a new way to deal with um, you know so my first question again is is broad and and to each of you um, you know all of us you know have taught. You know, the Israel-Palestine, uh, you know, the history of Israel and Palestine, the history of the conflict, and you know these personal humanistic histories that that all of you have mentioned in very different contexts. Um, we've all had to do it, as I, I've said before, in times like the present one where tensions are especially high. Um, you know, in that context, is there a specific approach, a question you ask in the classroom, a historical moment you focus on? A primary source, and we've already mentioned a few, that you have found stimulates an empathetic discussion, particularly well in the classroom. Um, and I, I'll start. I'll kind of go around the same way we did before, and I'll start with Michelle. Um, yeah, thank you. I would just want to add that I think as important as empathy is in the historical classroom, I think also curiosity, intellectual curiosity is really important. And they're sometimes related, but not necessarily. And so I just want to make that push um, to be curious about narratives that uh, one might not encounter even and I am upfront with my students that there will be reading sources that I personally find you know disagreeable or disturbing um, but we have to read all kinds of of sources and, and to understand and to be curious about what drives the various actors and how they interpret the events that are happening around them or that they are participating and carrying out as well. Um, I want to add to this uh, discussion and mention that Omar and Osama made for primary sources, personal narratives, um, to also add to the mix documentaries and documentary clips. Um, because one of the things that I found uh, over the years is that so few of my students have any familiarity with the region, have never been to the region, or if they've have, they've been on, you know, very, very narrow tours uh, or family trips. Um, and so that the picture that they have of what the region looks like or what the people look like or even sound like um, is quite distorted. And so I incorporate a lot of documentaries and there are excellent documentaries um, uh, dealing with the region for at least you know, the last, certainly the last 50 years, and some of them go back even further, incorporating documentary clips. Um, and I find that that is really helpful is in addition to these primary sources, uh, in terms of familiarizing students, at least with the visuals and with the sonics of the place, um, you know, and it it's sometimes confusing because students, most students don't can't differentiate between Hebrew and Arabic speakers. And so they don't know necessarily who is who and they're kind of forced, to, they don't necessarily know the names. So it can be confusing at times, um, but that's an important uh, thing to incorporate. And in terms of primary sources, um, I found that really juxtaposing a few different primary so sources on the same issue to be really uh, stimulating in the classroom. Uh, for example, alongside the actual Balfour Declaration, you know, I incorporate Wasif Johoria's comments on the Balfour Declaration. I think that section is called something like, it's out and it's terrible, which gives you an idea of, of his perspective on it. And, um, you know, 
and other perspectives on that particular moment and what it means. And then the students have more than just one text um, to be able to discuss that. Or for example, the UN partition plan, you know, I make sure to incorporate the minority report and so that they can talk about what those uh, differences were and what the implications of those differences were uh, for the sides on the ground. Um, so I think that's uh, something that uh, is important to, to really do. And I find also that uh, bringing primary sources that um, sometimes are counterintuitive is something that stimulates the most dynamic discussions in the classroom. So just some examples, um, you know, pre-World War I Jewish critiques of Zionism, for example, that I bring in, you know, whether it be from Ottoman Jews or even European or American Jews, students are shocked to read those. Um, as a very unexpected perspective, or even voices of, you know, Palestinian uh, secularists in the pre-World War I or um, mandatory period, something that they don't expect that Palestinians were secular and modern and cultured and all of these things, again, going to those kind of stereotypes uh, and real lack of familiarity that we have uh, in this country. Um, but even other things like going, you know, talking about this question of, well, should not just be a conflict, um, but really trying to give a sense of uh, the various societies. Um, so, for example, looking at the uh, history of Mizrahim inside of Israel and the kind of ethnic, internal ethnic uh, Jewish conflicts, as well as the conflict between religion and secularism amongst both nationalist movements. Uh, those are also moments in which students are forced to grapple with things that seem to them inherently contradictory. Um, and so that's what I find to be uh, the most effective. Thank you so much, Michelle. And uh, yeah, I, I should say um, I'm taking notes here. I'm sure the AHA staff and Katarina are as well. And you know, it is our hope to develop a resource list uh, that can be shared uh, with everyone who's joined today. Um, you know, in, co in in concert with our panelists and 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 some other input. And uh, the Wasif Jahariya's uh, stuff was at the top of my mind. Uh, you know, when we were discussing this question and. And just to say that that's um, you know a very important you know figure in the cultural and political history of of um, late Ottoman Palestine and, and whose whose diaries have been translated I, I believe and are, are available uh, in English. Um, it, John, not to put you on the spot, uh, Michelle, but uh, is there a, a particular documentary uh, that you think is is effective uh, that you you know love to use over and over again? Um, there are a few depending on what time period particularly we're talking about uh, in the 20th century, but I think one of the ones that was most powerful uh, the last time I taught this class um, in the spring was uh, Bridge Over the Wadi, which is a documentary about a joint Jewish-Arab school uh, in the Galilee in Israel, and it features school children. It was the pilot year of the program, and, um, you know, it, it has to do, children, of course, are so accessible to our teenagers in the classroom, um, and so pure in many ways, um, but it highlighted so many of the structural problems dealing with the conflict, even inside of Israel. And these are Palestinian citizens of Israel. This is a school which all parents have chosen to send their children to, um, you know, very much believing in kind of a certain coexistence within Israeli society and yet has so many challenges and problems. Uh, so the students reacted really incredibly uh, forcefully to that one uh, and found it to be really moving. But it's not something that without the context of understanding that there are different kinds of Palestinians and that the Israeli state, you know, has a different set of package of, you know, social, economic, political conditions than those in the Gaza Strip or in the West Bank or even in East Jerusalem. It wouldn't start with that. Um, but yeah, I can definitely recommend others. Um, but that was, I think, the, the one that they reacted to the most. Great, thank you so much, uh, Omer. I, I, to you again, I, a source, uh, a, a documentary, uh, um, you know, a, a, an approach, a question uh, that that you found really useful uh, in in times like this and in the context of uh, of this history. So you know, I've I've been teaching uh, on uh, Israel Palestine since twenty fifteen. Uh, almost every year I've been teaching a seminar or two. Um, but one that I've been teaching that I think, and I'm going to be teaching it this coming spring, and I've had to expand it from a 20-student cap to a 40-student cap because of what we are watching, uh, 
is a seminar on the Holocaust and the Nakba. Um, and that has been the course that has, um, I would say, been um, most interesting to students and to me uh, over the years. Um, and it's the, the, um, what the course does, in a sense, it speaks about uh, two historical traumas, the connections between them, displacement of people from one place to another and from that place to yet another. Uh, it speaks about uh, a sense of victimhood. It speaks about empathy. Uh, it tells you that the kind of history that you're used to study, there's, you can study history of Eastern Europe or history of the Holocaust or history of World War II, or you can study a history of the Middle East, a history of Zionism, a history of Palestinian nationalism, but they don't meet. That in fact, uh, they do meet. And they're, they're not just that there are connections between them, people moved from one historiography to another. Uh, and they brought uh, all kinds of ideas and all kinds of emotions and all kinds of resentments from one place to another. Uh, and so I found that to be um, helpful for students to understand, and we read all kinds of um, uh, documents as well, um, the, um, I'd say, some of the underlying um, um, psychologies, mentalities that have lasted over generations uh, from those events that can be identified chronologically within a particular time frame, but have actually resonated over decades, over several generations, uh, one of which is actually ongoing, of course, because the Nakba is not over. Uh, the Holocaust chronologically is over, but in fact has been mobilized uh, much more in the last few decades, also as a, as a, as a framework of identity, also as uh, um, um, a, a, a element in state propaganda. So, I mean, these are events that have both can be identified historically, it can be seen through time. And as for um, what can one use? So I mentioned two, two things. One is that I usually have students read two works of fiction, the short. One is Hassan Kanafani's Return to Haifa, which is a classic. And you can also watch it because it was also uh, a play. And the other is A.B. Yoshua um, facing the forest. Um, and they are informing each other. There's a conversation. There was a real conversation between them as well as uh, what they're trying to do. Uh, those have resonated quite a bit with students. I've also used an animated film, uh, um, one of the best animated films that I know, and I'm not a big fan of uh, animated films, but this one is, and that's uh, Waltz with Bashir. And I've used especially parts of it, I don't necessarily show the whole thing. Uh, but that works particularly well with this class, because uh, those of you who don't know the film, and I won't go into the whole story of it, uh, at the end of the film is the is the massacre in Sabra and Shatila. Uh, and the, the person who's telling the story of the film is sort of traumatized by that. And he ends up talking with various friends about what happened there because he kind of forgot it, he repressed it. Uh, and then he comes to a psychologist, to an Israeli psychologist. And the psychologist tells him, in fact, what you're traumatized by is not Sabra and Shatila. He says, were your parents in the camps? And he says, yes. He says, that's what you're traumatized by. So what the film does without the filmmaker actually, I think, thinking it through all the way, he basically says at the core of all that violence is the Holocaust. Uh, and therefore, whatever is done happens later on. 
it all goes back, so-called, to the camps. And students who've, who've watched it and talked with it, um, about it with me, and there's several articles that were written on that, very interesting, exactly on this theme, uh, have three, four, five years later have come up to me and said, you know, we still remember that discussion because it made us think about everything that we've been watching uh, very differently. So um, that's how I do it. It's uh, always uh, emotional to teach that. Uh, I don't, um, I should say, I'm not a big fan of sort of emotive uh, teaching or emotive anything in particular. Uh, I like it being dispassionate, but the event that you're talking about, the events that you're talking about themselves, um, um, so deeply felt by the students through the readings, through the documents, uh, that you don't have to express yourself. They participate in, in it in a very different way, and they understand that that kind of competition, which is at the core, if you want, of the conflict, but at the core of so much that happens between, uh, as I understand it, between uh, Jewish Israelis and Palestinians, uh, so much of that of these events is, is at the core of that conversation that it's, it can create, of, of these events, that it can create uh, empathy rather than competition. It can bring people to listen to other people's pain. Thank you, Omer. And we're, we're having, a, I'm loving this conversation, but I'm also keeping a little bit of an eye on the time and I want to make sure that Osama gets a chance to answer this question. I have so many more that we're probably not going to get the chance to answer. Uh, um, uh, but I also hope that this isn't the last time we have this conversation uh, in an AHA format. And I, I hope we can keep this ball rolling uh, in many different ways. Osama, please, uh, you know, what, what have you found most useful uh, in the classroom now and in the future in the past, uh, you know, in terms of questions, documents, um, that sort of thing. Okay, I mean, I think what I found most useful in terms of uh, doc, I'll get to the documents in a second, if I may, but what I found most useful is obviously being honest and, and telling the students, I don't know if high school teachers can do this, but just telling them, here's my perspective based on my education, based on what I've learned, based on what I teach, based on all the knowledge that I've amassed over decades of teaching. And I don't expect, of course, students to agree with me, but I do expect students to grapple with the texts and for them to be able to elaborate a historical argument based on the evidence. Um, and I remind my students that two things in a history class. One is that, of course, objectivity is not neutrality. It's not about being, you know, neutral. Neutrality is not objectivity in any way whatsoever. It's just, it just means taking, avoiding taking a position. Um, because truth can be exactly on this side as opposed to on this side, you know, and objectivity is not halfway between truth and falsehoods. I think that's a really important point to make, and you can use any number of examples outside of Palestine to to drive home that point. In American history, that's more accessible to the students or more familiar to them, whether it's civil rights, whether it's Jim Crow, whether it's anything in U.S. In Native American, Indigenous history, any number of cases that people um, um, you know, we'll be able to relate to. That's one point. The second point is to emphasize again and again to students is where you begin the story is how you make sense of what current events or what is happening today. And where you begin is absolutely crucial. And, and to justify that beginning and to sort of challenge students and to encourage students to think through why is it that they're thinking or why is it that we as, as scholars, why do we begin our histories in a particular, at a particular point? What is the justification for that? Uh, and so on. And so, I mean, there's a, there's a million other ways to do this, but those are two things that I emphasize over and over and over again, telling my students that um, that their their job ultimately is not to agree or disagree with me based on, on anything. It's actually to sort of grapple with the sources and to sort of formulate a historical argument based on historical evidence. Now, in terms of documents, uh, I would say, you know, I you know, I would agree with Omer, you know, Hassan Kanafani's. Uh, the return to Haifa is magnificent. So is Men in the Sun, which is a, um, but what, the way I begin the history is, of course, I call it a history of Palestine or the history of um, a modern Palestinian history is specifically what I call it, specifically to go back to the 19th century, to teach them, along with what Michelle was saying, all this, this complexity and the beauty that this is a place also of love, a place with coexistence, a place of history, a place of experience, multifaceted experience. 
So don't just start it with a conflict, because if you start with a conflict, you end up in this impossible situation of just negativity. And I think that's really crucial to start in the 19th century, for me at least. Um, in terms of documents, the King Crane Commission, 1919. It's a U.S. commission of inquiry that was sent out to the Middle East uh, at the behest of President Wilson. The document is available online, um, and they have a whole set of recommendations. It was an extraordinary commission. It collected a huge amount of archives. The actual archives are at Oberlin College, and they're online. So I would definitely, I always use that because that's that's an American commission, so the students can relate to that. Uh, I would also use, um, I'm also acutely aware, you know, as a Palestinian, you know, in America, is that if Palestinians say something, they're not going to be believed. There is that aspect of it, too, in terms of, so use, uh, like Tantura was a documentary that came out last year about a massacre in 1948 during the Nakba, and that's Israeli soldiers, mostly, or ex-soldiers and Israeli historians um, who are sort of talking about this event that's been suppressed, but they do it in, in a way that sort of, again, you know, it's not about the Palestinians per se, it's about the Israelis and their, so sort of what, what Omar was re, was referring to with Waltz, of, Waltz for Bashir, which of course is an Israeli soldier's trauma of, you know, relating to 1982 and the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, culminating in the Sabra and Shatila massacre. So Tantura is a, certainly a documentary I would look at, or I would, but I would also then also put in Palestinian production because it's important to emphasize Palestinian writing, Palestinian thinking, Palestinian, um, not just as primary sources, but also as people who are interpreting this history. Um, that is, there's a film that was uh, recently released called Farha, which is, of course, it's not a documentary as such. It is a, um, it is a, um, a feature film. It's, I think it's the first one that actually represents the Nakba from a Palestinian perspective visually uh, and and cin cinematically and i think it's really important for students to be exposed to that as well as being exposed to to whatever whatever excellent um you know i'm sure that there's a there's a ton of israeli productions of course that that one could use as well um but just again to humanize to humanize to humanize because that to me is the essence of what we do as historians is historicize and humanize uh, or or humanize to historicize, either way, however you want to think about this dialectic. But it's really important to go back to the sources constantly mm -hmm. and to always remind students where you begin the story is how you're going to make sense of what's going on today. And also, neutrality is not objectivity. It's really important to emphasize that point. No, thank you so much, Hussam. And I can't really think of a better place to, to close this off. Uh, you know, I've been reminded throughout this conversation of the very first uh, sentence of your most recent book, uh, which is on, you know, the history of coexistence. Every history of sectarianism is also a history of coexistence. Every history of conflict is also a history of coexistence in so many ways. And I can't think of a better way to kind of close that off. I have to hand things back over to Jim Grossman to close us off. But I want to thank you so, so much uh, for this really rich conversation. I think it's really important that we've done this in this time. And again, I want to thank the AHA staff for all the work they've done to make it possible. Thank you. Oh, uh, Jim, I, you're muted, so I'm going to. I want to thank the four of you. And I do want to uh, reemphasize Jim's comment that this is, in fact, a, an excellent way to end this, which is the relationship between humanizing and historicizing. Uh, and uh, Osama referenced the importance of thinking about the what do we really mean by concepts like neutrality, objectivity, uh, evidence-based. Uh, these are the things historians ref wrestle with all the time. And for those of you who are, who are uh, interested in pursuing that a little bit and on the obligations of historians that Osama pointed to, uh, I hate to, it, this sounds like a terribly boring document, but it's less so than you think if you're interested in history. I recommend to everybody the AHA Statement on Standards of Professional Conduct for Historians. If you just Google that, American Historical Association, you will find that on our website. And what you'll find is reflections on exactly the kinds of tensions and questions uh, and skepticism that, that Usama pointed to. Uh, I also want to emphasize that uh, the references to censorship and the pressure on teachers that have been referenced in this conversation are extremely important. And I, I would emphasize 
that this has been in recent years uh, something we've been seeing more of. Uh, pressure on history, on, on history teachers, uh, censorship of various kinds of, of classroom activity. Uh, we've seen this increasing, and the AHA has spoken out vociferously on this. And uh, if you Google teaching history with integrity, American Historical Association, you will find uh, all of the work that we've done on this. You will find letters to state legislatures, statements. Uh, this is something that is extremely important, that history teachers uh, be free to teach in their classrooms as professionals. Uh, and so I'm very grateful to the panelists for raising this issue. Uh, everyone who registered for today's webinar will receive a follow-up email with a link to a recording of today's event as soon as we can share it. Uh, and again, I want to thank our moderator and our panelists for giving so generously of their time today and for everybody who has spent uh, the last hour with us. If you have follow-up questions, please contact us and we will respond. Thank you.